Great. So, <clears throat> hello everybody. This is another conversation in Heart Community Group series, Adapting for an Uncertain Future. Uh, and you can find all our other conversations on our YouTube channel. Um, um, but tonight I'm delighted to welcome Stuart, Stuart Smith, who I got to know a little bit via the Deep Adaptation Forum. And Stuart is one of the moderators who do, does such a fabulous job on the Facebook uh, group there. Um, and uh, so Stuart, thank you so much for your time, welcome. Thank you, Kimberly, for the invite. Um, thanks for so many faces to turn up and listen to what I've got to say. Hopefully there's a one or two nuggets of wisdom amongst all of this. Um, as Kimberly said, I've been uh, moderating the Deep Adaptation Facebook group uh, for about three years now. I was a member for about a year prior to the invites to the moderation team. So um, prior to that, I thought I was well ahead of the, of the curve with regards climate change, um, which figured into our move to Italy um, about eight and a half years ago. Once I found Gem's paper, I realised I was way, way behind the curve um, and I've done a lot of learning since, uh, thanks to all the lovely people over at Deep Adaptation. Um, Kimberly's asked me to put a few photos together, which uh, maybe gives you all a bit of background as to where I am and what we're doing. And then I guess we'll go into a, a bit of a chat. Um, and then yeah, to take yeah. if you could just take about a max 10 minutes with the photos, because I'm keen to kind of ask you some questions as well but yeah show us show us where you live and uh where you live now no problem i'll i'll whistle through them um there's a two or three dozen but um, we can come back and talk about them in more detail so can everybody see um our countryside our house right so um we're in northern tuscany um what i like to call the real tuscany um it's a more affordable part of tuscany um so there's no tourism around here to speak of, um, which made it affordable for us coming from a three bed mid terrace in England. Um, we moved here for a number of reasons, one of which was to, to try and tread a bit more lightly on the, on the planet, reduce our footprint and live a bit, a bit more of a natural life really, um, in harmony with nature. So we found this little 12 acre plot, which was um, uh, formerly an old olive, Olive Farm. Um, our nearest town is four miles away and it has about 20,000 people living there. So we moved in. This was moving in day. Um, the house was sold in inverted commas, fully furnished. What you can see there is the, the furniture that was left behind. Um, so day one was, was getting rid of all the rubbish we'd left behind. We were also gifted by the previous owners 2,000 euros of unpaid bills, phone, electricity, water, um, and a 2,500 euro fine for work they'd done illegally to the property. Um, those kind of came out in the wash in the, in the following 12 months after moving in. Um, steep learning curve. Most of the time we've spent at this property um, has been taming the land. Um, it, as I said, it was originally an olive farm. So all the land around the property was, was terraced, earthwork terracing, and would have been full of olive trees. Uh, only about a quarter of that is now olive grove. The, the, the original tree is long since gone. Um, and since then, the woodland has been doing what woodland does and encroaching back on the empty on the empty land. So we've had a lot of trees to, to cut down and a lot of bramble to clear. You can see the house at the top of the property there. Uh, there's a few people and fishes really. So you can see we've um, done a lot of replanting. We've had one or two crazy friends that like to come on holiday and get stuck in rather than go sightseeing, which has been a, a real boon for us over the years. Um, and the terraced area, I guess, makes up about an acre in which the house sits right in the middle of. Um, what you're looking at here is a bramble forest where our vegetable garden now lives, which is down there. Um, the, the terraces of which we covered with landscape fabric for about four or five years to kill off all the bramble right down to the roots. 
um, during COVID, we got to start um, rebuilding those terraces with wood we've cut and reclined from um, the 12 acres of woodland we had. So we cut the wood, moved it to place, stripped the bark, split the logs, did the digging, um, and that's the result of, of that hard work, really. Um, that's how it stands at the moment. We have yet another level to do, which we'll, we've got a uh, plan for next winter. Um, that will be uh, the vegetable garden ready to, to, to utilise to its full. And in those beds, we planted nothing but perennials, really, for um, adding as much biodiversity as we can to the, to the landscape. Um, lots of things you've recognised, hollyhocks, bushes for bird life, um, and other green shrubs. And then because the wildlife we share this bit of paradise with don't understand what it means to share, um, we've had to fence the entire property, all the cultivated land in. So we've got about um, just over half a kilometre of fencing because we have um, wild boar, we have porcupines, um, badgers, uh, deer, two, two types of deer, red and roe. Uh, amongst other things, but those are the ones that um, when you're trying to grow food to eat, those are the ones that will come in and dig up your potatoes um, and everything else you're trying to grow. First job we did when we moved in was install a rain catchment system using some um, re repurposed IVC tanks. Uh, so that's a 6,000 litre water system, which feeds by gravity the vegetable garden down below. Uh, we ripped out the inefficient hot water system, hot water being one of the main uses of utilities, really, in, in most properties. So we've got a hybrid system, which uses a, a water thermal panel, which generally works April through October, and then an air source heat pump, which, which kicks in when the solar panel is not putting in enough sunshine. So that gives us a 300 litre hot water supply 12 months of the year without interruption. A fantastic system. I went with the recommendation of the plumber that I, I'd never met before. Um, glad I did because it's, um, it's phenomenal. With regards to heating the house, we use firewood. We've got 12 acres of woodland. Um, and we invested in a small secondhand tractor to, to move a lot of that wood around for us. And we have two log burners in different zones of the house, which we use to keep us warm from generally October through to April. Uh, and a modest wood pile there. Or we, we split all that by hand. Well, I'm not allowed to touch the axe. To, my wife loves splitting the firewood. I do the cutting and moving. Um, she, she does that. Um, and we've recently invested in a wood, a wood fired oven and a small rocket stove so that we can use some of the wood that we cut to, to do outdoor cooking. Not only that does, does that remove some of the heat from the house in the in, uh, intense summer, it's also um, good practice for, uh, for an off grid solution for some, some rudimentary cooking. Um, vegetable garden I mentioned. Yes. I, you know, and I don't even know where that came from. It was great. It was a plant that was growing out of the compost pile. I transplanted um, into the vegetable garden and we got four um, pumpkins of that size. So big, I had to halve them so that I could carry them up to the house. Yeah, that was two years ago. We're still working our way through it in soups. It's in the freezer at the moment. <laughs> at the moment. And we used uh, no dig gardening, which um, Charles Dowding is a pioneer of, for those that don't know him and his methods. I see Jilly waving. Um, so that's a system we try and follow very rigorously, very, very much believe in that. And um, anything regenerative, really, to try and get more carbon into the soil. We also have a small number of hens, which provide us with eggs um, and scrap. They, they, you know, they deal with the scraps for us and give us um, a fair supply of manure, which we use for composting our olive prunings. The olives need pruning, all 100 trees need pruning every year. Um, we chip the prunings and we pile them up into Johnson's to bioreactors with the chicken manure. And that gives us about half a cubic metre of um, fresh compost every spring. 
without having to turn it, which I like. Um, gluts. Gluts are different every year, but um, we try and preserve as much as we can, whether that's freezing. Um, we're doing with much advice from Jane to win along the call um, about canning. So we will do much more of that these days. Tomato sauces, sweet chestnuts. Um, half of our woodland is sweet chestnut woodland. Um, so there's, there's normally um, a good supply of those uh, if the wild boar don't get to them first. On good years, uh, we also make our own olive oil. And we have about 100 trees left, uh, which cover about a quarter of the cultivated land that we have. Um, so weather permitting, olive fly permitting, um, we harvest, press at one of the local mills, and that generally gives us uh, a year's supply of oil for, for personal use. Trees do underperform with 100 trees, it should be a lot more, but um, with every year, every year we go forwards with a bit more pruning and a bit more care, um, they yield a little bit more. So it's very much a work in progress. And there's the oil we pressed um, just a few weeks ago, actually. So with the rest of the cultivated land, um, once tamed, uh, we planted an orchard. We've planted about 55 fruit and nut trees up, and, up until this point. So we've got almonds, pistachios, pears, peaches, persimmons, plums, pretty much everything at the moment, um, to the point where we're running out of space. Uh, they're just starting to yield now. It was a poor year this year because the weather was bad right at the point when, um, when they came to flower. Um, that's just the way of it we're learning. Um, but as time goes by, they should yield at least some trees. Some of the years will give us a, few, a good few kilos of fruit, um, way more than we can eat. And following kind of permaculture principles, grow as much as you can so that you can give some away. So um, long term thinking is about that for us. Um, with the rest of the land, as we tame it, we're growing ever more. Uh, diverse plant life um, for, for, for the wildlife and the insects that we share it with really. We put in another 500 bulbs last autumn um, and we'll do another round this autumn. Um, it's, it's the ideal time of year for it. Um, perennials, it, it's, you know, it's work you don't need to, to do again. Assuming the voles don't find the bulbs. Um, we've also put in a small pond next to the house. Um, we had our first amphibian visitor this year sitting on the lily pad, very cliched, but very, joy very joyful to see it. Um, and we've noticed a staggering increase in um, dragonfly numbers since, since putting the pond in, which is fantastic. Um, apparently voracious eaters of mosquitoes, and we have no shortage of those here in central Italy. Uh, we also give um, a corner of our land to um, a, a local beekeeper every year. He puts 36 hives, um, as you can see there in the picture, um, at, for six months of the year they spend with us from spring through to autumn. And in our valley they produce um, monoculture honey. So in spring they, um, they harvest acacia and four weeks later, in January, the chestnut flowers and they produce chestnut. So he takes those away, harvests the honey and pays us um, royally with um, way more honey than we could ever eat. So again, we gift or we sell um, small amounts of that. We end up normally with about two, do two dozen jars of honey over and above what we can possibly eat. So it's a nice little setup. It's a corner of land we don't use, it keeps the grass down. And we have pollinators nearby. Um, we're also getting into um, soil food web research and now I now have a microscope to play with. We have a small wormery for producing castings um, and the appropriate kit for producing um, actively aerated compost teas to, to, to boost microbial soil life in, in vegetable beds. On top of that, we cultivate mushrooms on logs. Um, we started four years ago. Those logs on the right you see there are our first batch. They're four years old and still producing. They've probably got another year or two left in them. Those on the left are stacked up from last 
winter, and they started producing this spring, uh, this autumn, sorry. Um, and that's another project we'll keep um, enlarging because we can't produce enough for the small market we found actually. Um, and diversify also, these are just shiitake logs at the moment because they grow well in sweet chestnut. Um, it's proving difficult to get hold of the spawn post Brexit at a sensible price. So I'm going to have to get myself into producing my own spawn um, for mushroom spores. So that's a project for, uh, for this winter into next April. And there's a, a recent harvest. Good protein, good source of vitamin D. Um, and those you don't eat or sell fresh, we, you can just air dry and they will keep indefinitely in a, in a tight container that you can just rehydrate. And if that wasn't enough, we make soap. <laughs> it was always part of the plan eight years ago. It took until the first lockdown of COVID to find the time to do it. Um, so again, we, we make a small amount to sell. Um, we gift a fair amount as well. Um, and we, it keeps us in free soap for the year. That's a fun thing to do um, and a good project for winter. And there are some of the bars. So that is a quick whistle stop tour of what we've been up to in the last eight and a half years and kind of what we've got going on on, on a daily basis around here. We've, we've blogged about most of it um, for the first four years almost daily for anybody that's interested. Um, and I'm here to, to talk about it for anybody that has any questions. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, <clears throat> it's just hugely impressive, Stuart. Thank you. And thank you for preparing those photos. Um, such a lot of hard work. I, you know, I, when do you sleep? And, uh, <clears throat> and I understand before you went, you didn't know the first thing about farming. And no. neither, neither did you speak a word of Italian. No, I mean, we had a, a smattering of tourist Italian, you know, we could order an ice cream, we could get by in a restaurant, but um, other than that, no. Uh, night, night school was fairly useless, um, so we, we kind of jumped in at the deep end, yeah. And our garden in England was five metres by five metres. We had a couple of shrubs, uh, not even a tree. So it's been quite the learning curve. Uh, I'm sure it has. I'm sure it has. Thank you so much. And uh, I want to go on and ask you about what you've noticed about the changing climate there in a minute. But but um, what many people in the deep adaptation community are what we call collapse aware. What what does that mean for you? It goes, it goes much further than being aware of kind of climate change or whatever you might want to call that at the moment. I have most people now that I've come into contact with are aware of it to a point, generally think we can fix it. Um, electric cars are a solution. Um, what Jim's paper really did was dig much deeper and, and, and kind of unwrap, unpack the, the, the ramifications and how far reaching these, these changes and effects will be. You know, you, you find it hard pressed um, to look around and find something in your house, your garden, your wardrobe that isn't touched by fossil fuels, for example. Um, we are so dependent on this and people went to be collapse aware I think you need to understand that the whole house of cards will come tumbling down. It's a, it's a fragile house of cards as it is. And it's going to affect us in, 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 in ways. The common discourse, the common narrative doesn't, doesn't touch upon. No, no, no. And uh, <clears throat> how has that understanding uh, changed you? shaped you i mean and that together with the whole move and the enormous mm. amounts of work yeah what's how are you different now because i know you are mm, very much so um one of the biggest things for me was having to to genuinely confront my own mortality I'm very much dependent on i have a, a, um an underactive thyroid helpfully um, diagnosed with that six months before moving to Italy. Um, so I'm dependent on ferroxin for that. And, and without that, you know, one by one, all of my um, functions would 
um, shut down. So that was quite hard for me. It was, it was essentially, once I became collapse aware and I, and I understood that the environment will most likely affect my access to base medicine, um, it, was, it was essentially um, a, a terminal diagnosis for me. And I had to go through and soul search. Went to some, some dark places, uh, but it was transformative. And I've said on numerous, numerous occasions, I would never put this knowledge back in the box. It's been, you know, I find, um, I understood gratitude intellect on an intellectual level, but it never came to me naturally. It does most days now, mm -hmm. uh, without even trying, without even looking for it. I find joy in the most banal things. Um, truly transformative, confronting my own mortality. And it's, um, it's become a bit of a, a hobby of mine. It's, it's what I read about a lot. Yeah. It's been quite a spiritual journey for me. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine. And um, I know I've heard you talk before about the, the shift from anthropocentrism to <coughs> ecocentrism. And that you're, you're, you no longer see yourself as owning that land or using the land so much talk about that a bit no just um i'm very aware that i, I share this piece of land with um, a myriad of, of life forms um, all of which are necessary for me to to live well um, an important part of my da journey and getting my head around uh, the mess we were in was understanding my um, scope of agency where uh, where to stop worrying about things. And it soon became quite clear to me that um, this, this little bit of land we live on, um, according to Italian law, own, um, it's all within my scope of agency. Uh, and, and anything that lives on that, I have the power to, to, to get up one morning and try and improve the lives of hundreds, you know, and just by considering biodiversity. Uh, putting down places for the honeybees to drink water so they don't have to travel three kilometers to the nearest stream. Just, so I'm very much aware that I'm dependent. I'm not top of the food chain. I need all of, all of these beans, um, right down to the nematodes in the soil um, and everything that creates the nitrates, nitrites for, for the plants that I want to eat. I need absolutely all of it. Um, and I value it all. And, that, and that's kind of cultivated a, a real deep interest for me about insects and the birds. I'm just trying to identify, I'm obsessed with it, with buying books and guides. And uh, I want to know who I'm living with and, and, and how, I'm, how they're helping me and how I can possibly help them. That's within my scope of agency. And it, I think it's important to find something you can, you, you can do because I think you can often feel helpless in, in this the face of the scale of this mess we're in. Yeah, yeah, thank you. I'm going to throw it open to questions in just a moment. I have one more question, which is, um, I mean, in some ways I find myself feeling a bit of envy. Mm -hmm. um, probably not if I saw the amount of work there was to do. <laughs> um, but, you know, just just surrounded by that beauty and that nature and... and <clears throat> Um, but I don't think you're saying, well, let me know, you're not saying this is the solution, are you? Because it's... No. Okay. No. And you see, you've seen the amount of work we've done. I will be surprised if we supply 20% of our annual food, right? right? So we've got a, a, a horrendous distance to go. I don't, we're never going to get there. Um, it's not become about that for me. It was never about self-sustainability, 100% sustainability. It's about just improving, you know, lightening my imp our impact on the planet. And now it's become about helping the lives that I that I share it with. Um, as Dar Jamal said in in one of his interviews, it's about being in service of others. Yeah. It's, it's really crucial. Yeah. It's not. It's not about that. No, it's being in nature is a fantastic tonic. Uh, I wouldn't have wanted to be anywhere else. 
um, as I went through um, my journey of collapse awareness. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I, I remember being shocked when I first heard you talk about how, you know, in a sense, how little food you produce on that much land. Um, and, and, but even if, it, even if you were 100% self-sufficient in food, that, that's, you know, it's still not a solution for the other no. 8 billion. No. <laughs> no, and I'm, you know, I said we live we live near a town of twenty thousand, so it wouldn't take long for people to find out whether they were hungry, where to go, and get some food. You know, it's not a solution. What I do see as more important is trying to develop some kind of best practice, because okay. it may be the case that all of a sudden, in a very short period of time, everybody says, "Oh shit, we need to think about where our food comes from." And rather than have to learn, spend eight years learning like I've done so far, they can come here and poke at things, touch things, ask the questions and go away and implement this stuff. You know, I'm, um, I'm reading about desert gardening and trying to use clay irrigation pots. I'm, I'm setting up a system for that for next year. So I'm constantly trying to get ahead of, of that curve, at least. Yeah. So if, if, I can, if I can get some best practice implemented here that people nearby can come and look at brilliant then, I, then i've done my job yeah no that's really great and i know you've been having having very bad wildfires this mm. this this summer um i remember seeing some photos of them absolutely shocking like very mm. nearby you um mm. and and so you can see the climate changing yes yes i mean this summer was extreme um i mean we live amongst woodland we're in the in the foothills of the apennines so it's not uncommon to hear tre trees fall over and snap after excessive rain or after a, a heavy you know strong winds you know it's kind of violent weather it's normal it's, it's formed part of the cycle of it for, for forever what we haven't been used to is on hot summer days where there isn't even the slightest breeze the trees just falling over with unprovoked, unprovoked, you know, um, extreme droughts, extreme heat stress. Um, really, really unnerving, really, really unsettling. That combined with um, a very, a very large wildfire this winter. Yeah, yeah. Kind of grounds you, keeps you grounded and brings you back. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, <clears throat> Absolutely fascinating and um, oh, so so much in there to explore. Hands up if you have a question for Stuart and then you'll unmute yourself. Martha first, then Jane. Hello, Stuart. It's lovely to meet you and thank you for doing this. Um, Thanks, Martha. I live on 12 acres of farmland in North Devon. So you are mm. an absolute inspiration to me that it, it can be done. Um, I'm just wondering, what was the moment that you or your partner went, we've got to do it and we've got to do it now? Like what, what changed in you? And part B, how do you keep that motivation when you've got so many big projects? Mm -hmm. Two good questions. Uh, the first one's a little trickier to answer. We kind of talked, as many, many people do, wouldn't it be nice? Wouldn't it be nice to get off the treadmill? Wouldn't it be nice? Wouldn't it? Um, and we got to the point where we were, we were like, right, we're in a position now. Kids are at university. Um, we could probably make it work financially. Moving to a country like Italy from the UK gives you a bit of extra money to work with. Um, so it was a kind of now or never thing, really. We happened to bump into a guy, an English guy in the area that was um, selling property. That's how he was making some money. Uh, one glass of wine led to three. Um, and, you know, we, we left that holiday and said, right, we'll be back in August. You line us up some houses and, and we'll go house shopping. So it was kind of a snap decision. I think all the groundwork had been put in before that. Helen was tied with golden handcuffs in the publishing industry to, uh, to being where she was in a job she was particularly enjoying. Um, so, so it was just a combination of things that all, 
all led up to that point to make all that kind of snap decision. Really. Again, you get to the point where you have to jump off the springboard because you can't you can't plan everything. And the leap's the hardest part. Um, how do we stay motivated? <laughs> Motivation goes up and down quite a lot. Um, I find, and I'm getting better at allowing that to happen and not beating myself up about it. You know, I've, I've got a very Western mentality still, and I feel guilty if I'm sat down doing nothing for very long. Um, I'm getting much better at self-care and allowing myself some time to just recover, relax, think about other projects. And I, I know now, I have faith that my, my motivation comes back and generally quicker if I'm not beating myself up about it. I find new projects interesting. I'm about to, I've just set up a wood shop, uh, a little workshop outside. So I'm about to start wood turning on a lathe. So that's something else to keep me, just in case I didn't have enough plates in the air. You know, I, we've got wood, a few tools, why not? Um, I'm constantly trying to think of ideas um, that we can use the resources we have to, to, to help. You know? So change. Do you know? Do you know what the seasons help? The seasons. Yeah. Are, the seasons are massive because by the time you get to the end of one season, you've just had enough of one type of activity, and you're looking forward to the next one. So living here in in this context where you have to live with the seasons. Uh, it generally sorts my motivation out for me. I don't know if that makes sense. No, that does make a lot of sense. And I think I might take a leaf out of your book and uh, try and apply new projects. Because I do find as well that I get really bogged down in one big thing and you just get a bit tunnel vision. And actually, maybe you're right. And if I diversify slightly, it will keep my motivation up for everything. Thank you. Yeah. Variety is key, I would say. Um, because then I can flip back between different things. When I get bored of one thing, I can go, you know, I've got half a dozen projects every season, so and I can flip between them. That, that generally picks me up. I need you need something else that you can get stuck into when you bog down with something else. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you, Martha. Thanks, Stuart. Jane, did you have something? Do you want to come in? Are you there, Jane? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, maybe she'll come back. Who else has got something? Ray. Ray Hello. and Jilly, I can see. Ray and Jilly. Yeah, I'm, I'm fascinated by um, regenerative farming at the moment. And I've heard a speaker saying, I get up in the morning and I, with a great sense of excitement, uh, what I might learn about nature today. <laughs> He's doing what you've been doing, trying to understand the whole of the natural world around him. Um, and I just don't know how far this might take him or the rest of... He's trying to turn other farmers around and convert them to doing regenerative. But I don't... I have no idea, because I'm not... I have no connection with agriculture, really, um, how far this might go. Or can go. Mm. Mm. Have you got any thoughts? Time will be crucial. Um, it seems like things are unraveling quicker and quicker. Um, the problem is, I don't see how well you can regenerative, regeneratively farm in a big ag manner because it generally destroys everything it touches, the mm. soil and the life within it. So I see it as something for, for smaller scale farms. I also see smaller scale farms as being a, a key part of making more resilient communities um, and I don't think it will take much for many people to switch on and think right I've got a garden I've got a bit of space um, but that's that involves lots of people doing lots of lots of farming um, it's I'm becoming better at doing things without attaching an outcome to them right I think um, for my own sanity. I do them because they're right to do, because it's the best thing to do. And I, I kind of let the results sort themselves out because I can't possibly, I have absolutely no idea how much time we've got left. Uh, I mean, it's a problem I don't see we can fix, if, I, if I'm honest. Um, things do seem to be that bad. But um, I'm not what 
uh, the Michael Manns of this world would, would classify as a doomer. I don't just um, navel gaze and do nothing about it. You can see I'm quite busy. Despite my bleak outlook, um, I, I, I spend all my days, every day, um, trying to improve things for everybody and everything around. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Ray. Jilly. Um, huge respect, Stuart. I grow vegetables and, and um, wow, the, the harvesting and processing is a huge job. And I notice you have some um, houses near you. Do, how do you involve the local community? Um, and are those houses, have, have they got people in who come and sort of work with you collectively, collaboratively, and then you give them things in exchange, as it would have been, I guess, 100, 200 years ago in that area. As it would have been, yes. Um, our, our immediate neighbours um, number three properties, um, all of whom are local Italian families. Um, we know them well, we, we socialise with them well, we have a great relationship, uh, but none of them are, are far from collapse aware. Um, climate issues aren't really on their radar either mm. but they have um, Italy is still a very rural agricultural country um, um, so they, they all grow a little bit of something um, they're all planting trees um, it's just kind of part of their nature they're not so detached from it as we are in, in the west mm. um, and I hope don't have so far to fall because of that so collaboratively, not a lot. We, we try and gift, as I said, we gift a lot of what we produce to neighbours, hoping that will be of some inspiration when the penny drops and they go, ah, they know how to do that, or they've got this. Um, but what we do have is a, is a group of people in the valley, a group of friends in the valley, uh, on which we do work on what we call community days. So we work in cycle, we get together at one property uh, and between the seven or eight of us, um, we tackle a big project, whether that be um, felling some trees for the winter, um, you know, some real heavy hardcore stuff that would take one or two of you a long time to do. And, and then you have a, a very late long lunch and it becomes a social event. And we cycle those around as often as, um, as time allows and projects require. Um, and that's a fantastic way to, to have chats around the table about why things mm. are important and what needs doing. Mm. Sounds mm. great. Sounds great. And how does it work with Brexit, just briefly? Your, your mm. residency is secure, I'm guessing. Yes, it is secure because of how long we were here. Um, we've oh. now got our permanent residency. Oh. Um, I think the stickiest point for people wanting to move to, to Europe now, or certainly moving to Italy, is the driving licence issue. Oh. Had we not um, changed our driving licences to Italian before Brexit, we'd have had to have sat um, an Italian driving test in Italian. Uh, and while we're fairly fluent, it's still not as easy as just um, signing a piece of paper and handing over a couple of hundred euros. So mm -hmm. I believe talks are in place to change that because um, Europe wants um, what, Brits, Westerners, in their country, right? Because they bring money. Um, so no, we're secure. Um, we know people that are still doing it mm. post Brexit. I bump into people all the time that are still managing it. I can't imagine the, the bureaucracy they're having to wade through to do so, but it's, it's sure. possible. Sure, sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Julie. What else, Brian? And then Stephen. Just, just unmute your, myself. Hello, Stuart. Hi, Brian. <clears throat> I, I thought I had two questions, and I think you've probably answered most, most of them. I'm going to ask them anyway. Go for it. Um, how long ago did you start this project? Uh, about eight and a half years ago now. Okay. So just before my 40th birthday. Okay, well, however old you are now, if you could look back at your 40th, what would you advise your 40th mm -hmm. version of you, mm -hmm. um, looking back on what you've learned and everything that you've discovered since and all the hard work and everything else, would you do it again? Yes. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh, going back to what Kimberly said earlier. It looks amazing. Um, it's been so hard sometimes. Um, I suffer with depression. Um, that came knocking on my door about 12 months after my thyroid deciding it wanting a long term holiday. Quite a common side effect, but you know who knows whatever baggage is behind me. So I've had we've had some dark periods, but I wouldn't have wanted to do. Uh, transverse those dark periods back in the UK. Here, yeah. here it was possible, it was doable, it was beautiful. I haven't had a single day, not a single day, not even a moment where we've either of us have said, let's throw it in, let's go back. Yeah. Wish we hadn't done it. Okay. Well, that's... Um, well, that's yeah, no, absolutely. My, what I would say to my 40-year-old self is try not to finish everything because you're not going to... You know, I came here with grand ideas and wanted, I had a vision for what I wanted. Um, as always has been the way in my life, um, that vision never quite um, appears, but something better comes out of, out of the wreckage. Mm. Um, so just don't try and finish everything. I was working crazy, crazy um, at the first couple of years, thinking I could get everything done. Mm. To work in progress, be a bit kinder to yourself. When the motivation isn't there, don't don't sweat it. It will come back. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. There was a second question, but I can't remember what it was. Well, if you remember, <laughs> come back. <laughs> hey, thanks, Brian. Stephen. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Stuart. Really lovely to to hear you and your connection, and what this has brought to you and to others. Um, I'm just wondering, in terms of what we know about climate, you know, you've moved further south, whereas mm. I suppose I would have thought, you know, it would it would make more sense to, to move further north. Yeah. Um, so I'm just wondering, you know, your thoughts around that. But for, for other people, obviously, you're there now, and you're, but yeah. <laughs> Yes, we've rolled our dice now. And we're in this for the for the until the ride stops. This is where we are. This is where it finishes. Um, yeah, of course, we've gone closer to the equator. Um, maybe not the smartest move, um, but there's no saying. I mean, climate change is going to look climate collapse, climate derangement, whatever that is. It's going to look different for all of us. Um, and even in the north, in the UK, I think, whereas here it's going to be wildfires, landslides. Um, in the UK, it's going to be large scale flooding, uninsurable houses, um, and, 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 and potentially, you know, crop damage from, from extreme weather. So I can't second guess this. I'm not bright enough. Um, it's also too late. We just have to see how it goes. And I've got to think about, um, what plan B and C is, you know, we've got our, after the fire this year, we've got our bug out bag sorted. So I know we can leave should we need to. Um, I know I can water the vegetables should I need to. I know where I need water sources. Uh, as for the rest of it, I'm going to have to work. I'm just going to have to fumble my way through it as it happens, Steve, and just hope it doesn't happen too quickly. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Martha. Martha's always Honestly, I'm sorry. She's always <laughs> greedy with her questions, which is fine. No, it's I'm so sorry. I could monopolize your time for hours. I'm <laughs> just so constantly swamped by things to focus on. But I've just come to mind that you are a lot of your land is on a quite steep slopes. And I saw <laughs> the terracing that you've put in place. Yeah. Um water management. I don't know what it's like where you are, but do you have like heavily rainy seasons and how do you manage the water that comes down the hill around the house you know not to flood things out do you have gullies do you collect it do you have land drain yeah a bit of everything i mean the, the soil um fortunately um seems to drain very well so we've never had i mean landslides are quite common around here in this valley when when the rain does come down fortunately we've not had any it's also an important consideration for getting more organic material into the soil, right? So it can absorb much more of that. Uh, the house has gully drain, French drain. Um, that was put in when the house was built four or 500 years ago. Who knows when that was? Um, water from the roof, we take off and collect in systems. 
Um, we try and divert anything that falls near the property to somewhere useful if we can. Um, we've had to put drainage gullies into the driveway. Our driveway is about 250 metres long from the main road to the house. So we've had to, we've had to intervene there um, because it wouldn't take long for that to disappear. Yeah. Um, we're using things like vetiver um, in exposed places, which is um, it's quite possibly the best plant you can ever get your hands on for, for retaining soil. It's used in um, river erosion projects. Does need full sunshine, doesn't do well in the shade. Um, so we use that in, in choice spots. Um, and we try to use lots of um, plants, hedges in certain areas. So it's a constant consideration for us, Martha, the water, because when, when it does rain, it rains heavily. Yeah. Really, really heavily. Yeah, it's funny what you're saying about the drive, because I've literally today, I've just been digging out the gully down the side of my drive oh, as well. <laughs> An epic task. It's why I'm filthy and also <laughs> late, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. I understand. I guess that's the, the upside of uh, buying a very old property is that they did have an idea about water management around it when yes. they built it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I mean, it would have been damper. Downstairs, um, the house is on three levels and, the, and the, the, the bottom level, which is now a small apartment, which we were renting out to holiday makers, um, now, now is largely inhabited by family and friends. Um, that would have been a very damp room anyway, damp and cold, because the animals live there and help preserve food long term. So that's probably the one spot we, where we need a, a dehumidifier sometimes on and off. There's no other way for it. No yeah. damp courses anywhere. Uh, no cavity walls. It's just the way it is. But as for the rest of it, uh, the house stands up really well. And Brilliant. the property, thankfully. I mean, yeah. It does worry me. Landslides. Yeah. They're common. Um, I need Will vegetation be for it. And we're trying not yeah. to have too much vegetation too near to the house of any size in case fires encroach. So it's, it's finding yeah. where to draw that line. Yeah, well, I'll take my hat off to you. Best of luck. <laughs> Likewise. It's like you got <laughs> just the project as well. Yeah, thank you. I mean, any of you guys, I was going to say, if you want to find me on social media through Kimberly or whatever, we can carry on these discussions because um, I'm more than happy to pass on what I've learned the hard way to you guys. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Stuart. Davina. Hi, Davina. Hello. Had you considered finding somewhere in the UK where you at least wouldn't have the language barrier? Uh, yes, we oh, he's, can't. He's fluent now, I think. I mean, yes, not... yeah, yeah, fluent, fluent now. No problems now. I mean, I'll, I'll spend the rest of my days adding to my vocabulary, but I can have conversations about pretty much anything with anybody now. Um, but yes, I mean, it, it became quite apparent quite quickly that to have um, a property in the UK with enough land to play with was just beyond our financial means. So um, taking that um, the value we had in that three, that three bed terrace, three mid, three bed mid terrace, and moving that to England, uh, England out of England into Italy, meant we could we could get the land we wanted to play on and live that kind of lifestyle. And I, my wife also hates the cold and the short days, so we fixed that one as well at the same time. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I, I think a lot of us. When, when I was younger, we thought we'd, we might we, we might do this, but there's always family ties that's kept. There is. That, and that's the hardest, I think. It's the biggest obstacle. Um, as a friend I was talking to yesterday said, the hardest, people think this is much harder than it actually is. The hardest part is just taking that leap. Just that decision. That's the hard bit. The rest of it happens. The language comes. And you know what? With family, we see more of our family now than we ever did in the UK. Can't get rid of them. We had um, my mum comes out three or four times a year for at least two weeks a time. My father-in-law comes out twice a year for a month at a time, and we, you know, we kind of have the the kind of time that we never had in the UK. It was snatching a Saturday night in between work. Here, when you're together for two, three, four weeks, conversation gets much deeper. The, the quality of time together is much better. So perversely, it's um, it's been better for that. 
I think it's far understandable and easy to, to, to see those family ties as an obstacle. Thank you. Thanks. You're welcome. So we've just got a few minutes left. Mm -hmm. Who else has a question? Or just something you wanted to share? Oh. Stephen and then Ray. You know, I'm, I'm interested in the, the changes that you were describing that it's had on you. So, yeah, how, can you say a bit more about, yeah, just how this change of lifestyle ha has changed you as a person? Mm. I, um, I've become, I'm very happy in my own company. I don't need other people around. But I noticed I, I really thrive, really, I felt nourished from from being around other people, you know, small groups at the local bar, at a dinner table with friends. I really noticed, I appreciated it much more than I, than I ever did before. Um, an absurd example. Uh, my neighbor called me Saturday morning and said, by any chance are you around? I've got some trees I need to cut down. They're gonna fall into the road. I need somebody to stop the cars, help me clear up. Said, no problem, I'll be down. Um, and we couldn't work for cars stopping to talk to me. And the, my neighbor said to me, I've been here for 40 years. You know more people than me. You should run for Syndica. You should run for the mayor. Everybody seems to <laughs> like you. And I I've just become this person, this gregarious, um, looking for contacts, looking for to, to find out who's who, who does what. Um, it's also part of, a, of being a resilient community, right? I think um, we're too, too used to being independent, seemingly independent. The money that we earn in the West means we can ship our dependency off to, to other shores. We don't feel we need other people because we can buy the stuff we need. So I'm looking to create dependency again by being helpful to anybody and everybody. I say yes to, to, to far too many things, but it means I'm, I'm getting really quite deeply into the community. Um, and I really like it. And it's a good medicine for me also, Stephen, to, to, to talk to these people also in a different way than before. It's, it's not so shallow. I listen more and I want to know what other people want out of life. I'm still I'm still fumbling my way through this myself. Also, right? It's um, I've only I've only come to this myself enough three or four years, so um, I've got a lot to learn. It's changed me in profound ways, and all for the better, all of them. Ray. Yeah, I, I'm absolutely fascinated also by the this the social thing people's need to communicate more but I, my question was one you won't be able to answer but i'd be interested in a couple of thoughts <laughs> it was only today i think that i read that the government has just approved the production of meat f in the laboratory from cells of chickens something along those lines mm -hmm. so i i'm i'm always interested in Alternatives to agriculture, and I wonder what you think about the laboratory approach to meat production. I think it's a temporary stepping stone, uh, really. Um, I think if it helps devout meat eaters realise there is an alternative, then that's great. Because for a lot of people, uh, the idea of just cutting meat meat out of the diet or reducing it right down is just um, it's unapproachable you can't you just can't go there with people so i think if it helps people substitute some of that agriculture which we all know is a, is a massive contributor to, to to greenhouse gases if it helps that in the meantime but it's not the solution the solution is just stop eating it altogether eat the plants right just get over it eat the plants the plants are good for you um it's not a solution, but it's, it's helpful, I think, Ray. Very good. Wow. Oh. 
That flew by, didn't it, Kim? It did. It really did. Yeah. Wish we had another hour now. Anyway, yeah. um, thank you so much, Stuart, and everybody. Um, is, is there anything you'd like to just kind of share with us as we say au revoir here, Stuart? Um, I mean, you've said so much already that is so rich. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I think just just an important thing I'm coming to the awareness of lately is just to be a bit kinder to yourselves. We're not going to get it all done. We're not going to find fixes. Just be kinder to yourselves a little bit, you know, take the time out and don't feel bad if you've got the time to take out and do the things you enjoy that makes you feel good. Read that book rather than check your email, you know. Just be, just be a bit kinder to yourselves because it's, we haven't got, we never had long left. As our wise friend John Doyle said to me in a conversation, well, oh, today's all we've ever had. Yeah, yeah. Today's all we've ever had. There's, there's, yeah. there's no saying, I'll open my eyelids tomorrow morning. So just be kind to yourselves and take a bit, find, find a better balance. Not the balance that the West wants us to have, which is completely warped and, and, and only benefits the people making a mess of the world. Take that time out, make it work, find it, find the solution. This was our solution. You know, we get by on um, Helen's, Helen is generally the only person here that earns money. Um, and she only does that on a part-time basis for six months of the year. And life's wonderful. Stuart, thank you so much. Everybody, if you want to unmute yourself, I will post the recording uh, and let you all have the link to that. Uh, and deeply appreciative, Stuart. Hmm. Um, so yeah, everybody just just say thank you and goodbye. Thank you. 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 Thank you.